we were talking about before the break, and thank you for listening. If you're just tuning in, hey, glad that you are a part of the show. We were talking about the Spiegel and Parkins talk with Joe Madden today, and Spiegs was talking, had said before the interview that he wanted to talk with Madden about does he have the anger club in his bag? Because, you know, Joe, as, as callers to this show have called him Groovy Joe, Joe is not really the guy that you're going to see go after his players. Now, we've seen Joe go after umpires and sometimes talk crap to someone else. Like we said about the Cardinals, you know, they think they invented baseball, you know, that sort of thing. He does that. But when it comes to players not performing or playing poorly, that's not usually the route that he takes. So when I heard Speaks talking about this, I was like, okay, I'm curious to see what Joe Madden has to say about it. I want you to take a listen to it. And then I want to ask you a question about it. This is Joe Madden on the thought of getting angry at players. I've, I've never really um, advocated that method. Um, I've, I, I know what I like, how I like to be coached uh, growing up. Um, and like I said, if there's something to be uh, relayed where you're, you're disappointed in somebody's, and that would come from effort more than anything. That doesn't come from lack of performance, and that's where you have to be careful. When you want to be critical of players, um, don't, don't criticize their effort. If you want to be critical of players or professionals, you might want to criticize their performance, but that doesn't require anger. That probably requires more work or a breaking down of the situation. Um, anger has no real uh, place in regard to, I think, motivation. I've always been much better suited to motivation through communication as opposed to through intimidation. That's a really temporal method. So if you're, you know, for the group out there that really likes anger as a method of motivation, I promise you, <laughs> It's very temporal, especially in 162 game season. Temporal, um, help me with temporal. Like temporary. Oh, temporary. Te- temporary. It's, okay. It's, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, because I, I mean that's what that, that's what I'm, I'm sitting here wondering whether like the anger tool in the toolbox is something that ever has a place. Like, is it is there? Do you ever see it having a place with a team if they're if they're dead walking or or just you know sleepwalking through their 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 season or something like that? Um, like I said, it only to me that's only uh, I've only gotten to that point uh, professionally is when I thought a team didn't care or was not putting forth the effort. That's when you get angry because that's probably the only way you would shake them up. But there's not one guy on this team that I can tell you uh, doesn't work properly, doesn't go out there with the right intent on a daily basis, uh, whatever. Um, so for me to them, if I have a, a message to put across, it, I mean, if there's something that requires more, I would just have somebody one-on-one in my office. I've talked about this before. Um, you um, criticize privately and, and you praise publicly. I mean, again, all the methods that uh, them, probably a lot of your fans uh, want to, to incorporate, I promise you, it's a bad method. It's a bad method. It doesn't have any kind of lasting impact. And with and I work with these guys every day. These are we're part of a family. So just imagine your own family too, with the, with your kids. Uh, there might be a time to get angry with your kids, but you have to be very careful with that. Mm-hmm. And for me, it's more of a communicative situation. I want to teach my kids. I don't want to get angry at my kids. That was Joe Madden on the Spiegel and Parkin show. And I think a really interesting concept for conversation by Spiegs. And Joe's answer. I'm, I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised that that's his approach because it's been kind of who he's been throughout his tenure as being a manager, even going back to being a bench coach or a guy that worked in the scouting department for, for the Angels, a minor league instructor, all of those things. His approach has always been a, a more, a softer touch. And, and maybe I'm, maybe I shouldn't even say that because it has a pejorative connotation to it when, when we talk about softer. Here, here's what I'm trying to understand. And it, it goes into me delving into myself where you try to figure out what type of stimuli you respond to different people respond to different stimuli. I go through this with my students where you have to learn quickly, like what motivates one person. And sometimes you honestly like get it wrong where you think this motivates this person and this motivates another When it comes to sports, our emotions are on high. And I think that a lot of that has to do with how games are produced, how they are packaged, how we discuss them overall, that we do end up in this fever pitch. What I I don't have a great grasp of is why, why we think that the yelling, screaming guy 
cares more than the guy that doesn't? Why is it ingrained in us to go, well, this, this guy is showing us passion. That's, that's usually how we couch it. Well, this guy, he's passionate. You know, I can use an example. Ozzy. I love Ozzy. Ozzy's passionate. That there's something about it. But does that, at the time, does that make him a better manager, one of his contemporaries, than Ron Gardenhire, for example? Because Gardenhire wasn't as vocal or as red-faced. Occasionally, you get red-faced. Does it make him a better manager? Does it make him a better coach? Now, I don't know if 100% of the guys will respond to Joe's method. I think that that would be arrogant on his part to think that everyone in there kind of gets motivated by the same stimuli. But I do think the majority of the clubhouse, the locker room, does respond to that. I spent most of my career covering football players every day. I, I am, when it comes to athletes, like dealing with athletes, I am most comfortable around football players. And it's funny because we have this kind of Hollywood style belief. Like everyone's, I was watching Any Given Sunday la- two nights ago. And you know what I kept thinking? Like, why should we ever trust Oliver Stone? Because he got so much stuff wrong in Any Given Sunday. Like so, like, so much stuff was just flat out wrong on how teams are run, how teams are covered. There was some stuff that was right, but a lot of it was just flat out wrong. But when I talked to players and I covered the, Lovey, the whole Lovey Smith era, like that's when I started covering football every day, uh, the end of Dick Duran, the last season of Dick Duran, and then into Lovey Smith. Both of those guys kind of were from the same school as far as dealing with players, their approach. Lovey was a manipulator. He wasn't going to yell and scream, Lovey doesn't cuss. But he would play mind games with players. You know, like he would, I remember a story being told to me about Adewale Agunlia, that he wanted to get more out of Adewale, and he basically brought him up to the office and was like, man, we, we could really use more pass rush. You know, I mean, I know you're doing your best, but I haven't done my loving in a while. So hold on. <clears throat> we know you're doing your best, but I mean, we we got to get to the quarterback a little bit more. And we thought that that you be be the person that be able to do it. And and we really hope. But I guess that you're you're doing all that you can. And we're just not getting to the quarterback. He he was that guy. When you talk to players of that era, they tell you he treated us like men. That there wasn't a lot of rah-rah. There wasn't a lot of screaming and yelling. Here's what I want to know. In your daily life, in your job, in, I know that like when I play pickup ball, if, if it ever happens, don't be screaming at me. I, I'm a grown-ass man. Don't scream at me. There's no reason for you to, especially pick up ball or like intramural stuff. Like there's no reason for you to be screaming at me. I want to know where we learned that. And if any of us have taken it out of our daily lives. Because I think Joe's right. I think for, for the most part, I think Joe's right. I don't think that the guy flipping the table over, shout out to Kenny Williams, the the guy flipping over the table, the guy screaming at his players is going to get the most out of them. I think that it's, it's possible that the opposite is true, that it's, it's a lot easier to go over the line and lose a player acting that way versus being fired up and fired up and and being passionate and yelling at that player. So I know that this topic takes a little bit of introspection and some reflection on your part, but have you thought about the real-world context of 
the things that we tend to advocate when it comes to player-coach dynamic and getting the most out of players. 312-644-6767. Eli, you look like you've been wanting to say something for five minutes. What you got? Well, you're talking about playing pickup ball, like screaming and, and teammates and such like that. You And this also has something to do with DePaul, too. When I was playing flag football at DePaul, uh, a teacher was on our team. I won't, I won't say names, but a teacher was on our it team. It was not me. Make it that clear, not, please. I promise it was not Lawrence Holtz. Okay, good. So it was probably the first half or whatever of the game. And I must have missed a block. But in flag football, you can't really put your hands on somebody. So your your arms are out. You're, you're, I'm blanking on the word that I want to see with my arms. But your arms are out, and you're trying to block. So I missed the block. The teacher comes up to me. He says, bleep and block, like really loud. And I was taken aback. I was like, uh, what am I supposed to say back? And then I swore back, and then didn't end up well. But the point is, like, I, I, <laughs> I agree with you. I mean, you can't. People take – no one's going to – first of all, no one's going to take being sworn at by a teacher in a flag football game well. But people people answer to, to – uh, people respond to criticism differently. I, I wonder if the money is part of it too. That we think, well, because this person is making so many million dollars, it's okay if they get screamed at. And, and if – look. If you're one of those people that does respond to it and a coach knows that and they that's how they want to, if they're intuitive enough to know that that's the thing that rattles your cage to get you doing what, what they need you to do, I'm okay with it. But the blanket, the blanket, well, everyone, you know, this guy messed up, the, the, he should be screamed at. I I think it's weird and it's wrong that we, like, we go to that place because at home we might be screaming at the television and we think that the coach should also be screaming at said player, not realizing that we're going to calm down in two minutes and there are no consequences to it for the coach screaming at the player. uh, Yes, Herbie. I was just going to agree with you. Yeah. You yell at a player, you might lose them and, when you're talking about Lovey Smith, I heard one time where he went in the locker room and M, not MF people, but he wrote, raised his voice up to a level and everybody's like, wow. Whoa. Yeah. What the heck? He means business. Yeah. Because you, I think that it can be more effective when you don't do it all the time. And, and you, as Speak said, you have it in your bag, but you rarely pull it out. Yeah, and these are grown men and women. The last thing a person wants to be is get yelled at. Yeah, if you're la- slacking off, like uh, what was it? Barry Bonds was slacking off at pro- practice, and Jim Leland let him have it. That's doable, and that's makes it uh, so the other people know that slacking off is not acceptable. But if you miss a block like Eli did, or you don't get the sacrifice bad down like that. <laughs> Yelling at that person, that person already knows he did wrong. So yelling at that person, will, I think sometimes is counterproductive. So now you're going to have that person self-doubting and not confident and go out there with the same type of like uh, sad sack attitude out there because it's going to get yelled at. Hey, Eli, can we punch up Julia? I'd love to get her perspective on this too. Hey, hey Jules. Yeah. Okay, so we're, we're having this discussion. I know you're probably getting ready for your update. No, but, I'm listening. Okay, so you've got kids, right? Yeah. Have you tried? Have you figured out the stimuli that they re- respond? Like, I, I can see you raising your voice. Like, I, I, could, I could imagine it. I, but how often do you go to that bag? Um, I try not to do it very often. I am really lucky. I have to just raise my eyebrow at my kids, and they immediately are like, oh, sorry. But, you know, the thing is, how many, and for all these people who want managers to scream and yell at people, how many of us want to get yelled at at work? That's what I keep coming back to. Yell at someone else at work. I think that that's the thing we're not thinking of, that this is, this is people's workplaces. You know, like you don't want someone to come in screaming at you in your office. Why was it any different at a ballpark? I, you're, you're so right on. And he, and he talked a little bit about that, but you're right. And the texter says, look, yelling raises the anxiety and makes it worse. I, I think that you're probably right about that. Because I know that that at this point in my career, like, don't come in here and scream at me. 
Come yeah, here. right? I mean, you, you're professional. You come here and scream at me now. There, there could be, be some smoke in the city. And no one wants that. You know, no one wants it to escalate to a different level. But but I, I think that some of it has to do a little bit with the cash, too. People think, oh, well, these coddled millionaires, they deserve to get screamed at. I think there's some of that in there, too, Jules. Well, I think also, I agree with that. But I also think that so many of us use sports to blow off steam that we're not thinking of this like it's someone's career and it's their job. You know, it's fine for us to go out and play a pickup game and yell and scream at each other because that's how we relax. This is what they do for a living. They don't do this to relax. There's no screaming. I mean, there shouldn't be. Thanks, Jules. I appreciate you jumping in. 312-644-6767 is the number if you'd like to be a part of the conversation. Roselle and Ed. Hey, Ed, you're on the score. Hey, Lawrence. How you doing, man? I'm doing well. What's on your mind? I love your topic because I deal with athletics in various fashions, and I just love when people find that whether it be a coach ever to start screaming at people, whether it be the players, whether it be other fans, whether it be whatever. And I appreciate a lot of different sports on top of working uh, in my professional job uh, with a lot of youth sports and such. I just find it hilarious on every end that – and the grown adult feels it's okay to scream at anybody, let alone a kid, and then sit there watching. You know, I get you pay your money, you buy your ticket, you do what you want, but the idea that, you know, Renteria or whoever needs to go out and scream at a player, like I remember when Ozzy caught a lot of flack for people that players not throwing at people and all that crap, I just love it. Because it's like, as an official on the field and you see coaches screaming at football players, so we're sitting there laughing, like, what the hell's wrong with this guy? You know? <laughs> I appreciate you checking in. 312 644 6767 is the number. Let's go out to Portage Park and Janet. Hey, Janet, you're on the score. Hey, Lawrence. Um, as far as this topic with um, the anger issue with Joe Madden, like, I think that some people can get angry, not necessarily Joe, but get angry and not have to raise their voice. It's he comes from a position of being such a, a like a flower child type thing where nothing ever everything's always in the middle of the road and everything's fine and all this other stuff. Yeah, but but here's the thing though, Janet, that that like his background is the exact opposite of that. You know, you know Joe Madden is from a hard scrabble Pennsylvania town. Like he but, he's not. I mean, I I doubt that he would even consider himself. A, a quote unquote flower child. But maybe that's why he's like he is because sometimes the reverse happens to you. You are treated a certain way and you become the direct opposite. But what I was getting at is like uh, when he has these interviews um, after the game or before the game, he always comes across like um, everything was wonderful. And every once in a while, you'd love to hear him say, I told him the guy to get his head in the game, you know, quit you know, focus on the game and, you know, you'd like to hear him say something negative every once in a while. And that is kind of his way of showing anger. I think. All right. You know, that, that's fair. Like I, the volume issue is the, one of the issues with me, but you're right. Like Joe can be honest without being loud. That, that honesty can come across. And I, I know that as a reporter, that was a frustration with, dealing with lovey where there would be things that that he clearly was not happy about oh lawrence lawrence, lawrence. <laughs> and, and when i would call him out on it in in the public he didn't like it and i i understood why he didn't like it which i'm not sure that he understood that i understood but he needed to understand that i had to ask the question because there are fans that go well wait don't tell me that, you know, that you're urinating on my leg and it's raining, right? Don't urinate on my leg and tell me it's raining. That's that's what you're you're saying. Like just be honest and truthful, but a lot of times those corrections come in a practice or in a meeting, like Joe was saying where he can have it in private. 312-644-6767 is the number. Why are we so compelled to want professionals yelled at when we're watching sports. Lake Barrington and Jim. Hey, Jim, you're on the score. 
Hey, Lawrence. Uh, good evening. Um, it's not so much the yelling, uh, but it is definitely a firm a manner. My daughter played uh, soccer and still plays in her well into her 20s, and she's had many coaches that took it different ways. One of her coaches was German and would swear at them in German, and it was lovely. They enjoyed it. They laughed at it because they would work hard on, on stuff all day and all week during their practices, and if they screwed up, they knew it. And if they got yelled at in German, well, coaches. But but Jim, if they it, up. if they screwed up and they knew it, then why why does there need to be a raising of the volume or cussing at I them in German? I, I I didn't say screaming. And I didn't say raising the volume. Just the firmness to it. And you know. No, but but I mean, know. you're talking about cussing at children, though, Jim. Oh, that not really children, and they're tough. They're how old was your daughter when she was getting cussed at in German? Oh, probably eighteen or nineteen. Okay, that's that's but that's the that's the nature of but, a but, lot of if they're getting along to a certain point. But here's the thing, though, Jim. If someone on the street just started randomly cussing at your 18 year old, you'd be this furious. Isn't this isn't random. This is a coach that she worked with, and I had a program that she'd been with for years. I get it, but but, but why does that make it right? I didn't say it was right or wrong. I just said that's the way it is, and they and they enjoyed it. They laughed at him. I they would laugh there, don't you? I bet you they didn't enjoy it. They may have dealt with it because they wanted to play, but this idea that they enjoyed it—what they did was they learned how to mock the coach. Yeah, and, they knew when he sp- start speaking in German. It's like, huh, this is dumb. You know, we're not going to be listening to what this guy says. We don't understand German. It's dumb. Instead of taking what he's saying as direction and getting better at the game that they're playing. Like I said, the stimuli for everyone is different. I I don't have a problem with Joe's approach. I just think that it's interesting that for some reason we feel like the way that it should be done when things go wrong is that people should turn up the volume and start the cussing. And I'm not sure that's effective. And it's hard to point to a time when that was effective. When we were joking during during before the show, when we were talking about doing this, well, Dicka, yeah, Dicka was cussing in eighty six and eighty seven and eighty eight and eighty nine. He the was Saints. cussing in New Orleans, and what happened? Nothing. We got a couple more phone calls to take, some text messages too on our subject of whether or not why we why we feel the way we do when it comes to oh, this coach should get some red ass in them and yell at these guys and that'll make them better. 219 texter says, I think everyone wants sports to reflect a militaristic model. So fans believe a coach should act like a drill sergeant. Yeah. I, I, I don't disagree with you. I think they're, especially in football, there's a lot of military symbolism that's going on there. A lot. Some of it's forced, and it's ridiculous. That's another thing. 708 Texter says, we all raise our voices. When you disagree with a caller, your voice goes up. You use it to get your point across, just like a coach or a teacher. That is, that is apples to oranges. And think about this. I mean, I do a lot of introspection on stuff like this. Do things get better when I yell at people? Not really. They maybe be a little bit more entertaining for a little while, but I'm not a better host. It, it's, a, it's a thing that I go through with all the time. I talk about this, like, I think about the person that I was when I started hosting, like, regularly, when I was 27. That guy hates me. The 27-year-old version of myself looks at the 42-year-old version is like, what happened to you? You sell out. Why aren't you screaming at the top of your lungs and banging on the table like you used to back in the days when you and Z were doing shows together? You know why? Because it doesn't, doesn't accomplish anything, at least for me. Now, industry-wide, that's what you like. You love it. You love it. 
You can't wait to get to Twitter when something crazy goes on to see what Stephen A. Smith has said. You love it. You can't wait to see what garbage Jason Whitlock is throwing your way or Skip Bayless. Can't wait. But for me, that is that is not the person I am more frequently. Like back then, I'm, I'll fight you. 27-year-old version of me will fight you. The 42-year-old version of me is like, I don't, I don't have time for this. It's, it's not as good. It's not as fun. And that's, that's the realization that Joe is talking about. You do all this scream. Think about how many times you've even gotten annoyed with a coach that does this all the time. Now, now imagine you're one of those players. Like, oh, there he goes again. What is crap? And just because it's the way things were doesn't mean it, it, it's the way it always has to be. And you find a lot of great coaches where when they're teaching, they're, they're not teaching like that. There might be an emotional outburst here or there, but they also have to realize that they're trying to set an example. Joe's whole thing is that he doesn't want to flip out because he doesn't want the rest of the guys to flip out. And I think that there's some some merit to that. Hey, Bill, you're on the score. Yeah, I just, uh, I've been uh, coaching, I just stopped a couple of years ago. I was coaching football for about 34 years. I coached kids from nine years old all the way up through seniors in high school. Um, I started coaching in the, the Grant and Ravens, just like you guys were talking about. Um, and I think the reason why I did it was because that's the way I was coached. Um, so what made I you change, out, Bill? Well, I found out that, you know, the more and more you scream, and I think you guys already brought that up, the more and more you scream, it because it comes down to a deaf ear. Um, if you choose your point, but it's not necessarily screaming at the kids, but just raising your voice. Um, if you raise your voice and the kids aren't used to it, they those eyes pop up. It's like, whoa, what are you doing? You know? Um, and I was never one of those coaches that really belittled kids or put them down. Everything I was doing was always to try to teach them. And uh, But I, I, I found out that it was just better for me that I just calm myself down a little bit. Yeah, that makes sense. Someone tweeted me, and you can find me on Twitter, at Lawrence W. Holmes, George tweeted me, culturally, we love when celebs are held accountable, and I think Joe consciously strives to, to not feed that. You can be held accountable without someone screaming at you on television. And the example I gave was Kyle Schwarber. Kyle Schwarber was held. No one screamed at him. Joe didn't scream at him. Jed didn't scream at him. Theo didn't scream at him. You know what they did do? They sent him to Iowa. You're not playing. And they told him why. I just think that it's it's interesting that we want these guys and these women yelled at. But we, the way we would react if it was done to us in our everyday life, it would be explosive. Like your boss starts yelling at you. You start yelling back. Things get said. Lombard and John. Hey, John, you're on the score. Hey, Lawrence. Yeah, I, I kind of feel like it's a multifaceted um, answer for this. I, I, I felt like the military had something to do with it because a lot of uh, sports, you know, people associate with military, so I won't really get into that. The other thing I feel is that, like, people, when they look at athletes, they almost look at them like possessions. They don't really have a humanistic value to them. They look at them like they, when they talk about the team they root for, they say us and we. So they kind of, like, possess that athlete, and they feel like, they should be yelled at. They never look at it from the athlete's point of view of, hey, you know, I'm the one getting yelled at. I'm the one out here performing. They also don't look like, and it expands to just not only being yelled at. If you ever follow any athletes on Twitter, they can post something political and people will go off on them. Like, what do you have an opinion for? They forget that these people are human and they don't ever associate that with them. You know what I think is funny about that, John? I, 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 to, to take your point a little, a little further, I think it's always interesting that whenever there is a dispute, between players and owners that fans routinely 
and, and, and to a, a big, big majority, side with the owners. And they see themselves as being the owners instead of being the players. It, where in their real life, they're nowhere close to being the owners. They're closer to being the players. I, I agree 100%. It's kind of a fascination that people have in their head. They assume that just because they root for that team, that that team is theirs. So, therefore, they want to they want to project always with the owners. But they never look at the athlete's point of view of like, hey, you know what, the owner's the owner's always going to be taken care of because he's the owner, and they're in business to make money. So no matter what happens with the player side, that owner is not going to lose any money because he's already made the money. And people never look at it that way. They always say like, oh, you know, they always say athletes is making twenty million dollars. All he's doing is hitting a baseball. But no one ever says, hey, that actor just made twenty dollars. All he's doing is acting in the movie. Or that the owner is making billions. These coddled millionaires. What about the coddled billionaires? Downers Grove and Chris. Hey, Chris, you're on the score. Hey, Lawrence, you got an awesome show. Thanks. I appreciate that. Hey, there are that mentality, especially on a football field, that it is a militant type situation. Well, not militant, military. There's a difference. I think think we were proving that if you have a a militant sensibility, you don't get to play in the NFL anymore. But you were saying. But I played all sorts of sports growing up, and definitely for sure on the football field, that was that attitude, that there was that screaming, that yelling, especially on a team of, say, a group of guys that really didn't know what they were doing out there. That's where all that yelling and screaming comes from a lot of times. Yeah, and it's weird because at the lower levels is where there should be even less screaming. When you have, we have children that are trying to learn the game. Screaming at them is not great. My opinion, I don't, again, I don't have any kids. I am around students though. I don't think that I've ever screamed at my students. Eli, did I scream at you? Every day. Every day. You deserve it. No. Um, but I, I, and I'm realizing now, like, how far away I am from my students. Like, you think you're young, but you're not young. At this point, theoretically, my students are young enough to be my children. And so, like, the concept of yelling at them, it seems like, like it's not going to work. And not to broad brush, but this generation of kids doesn't seem like that's their, that that's how you get to them. That you can, you can keep all that, that nonsense you talking about. I'm going to be over here. That you need to interest them. Teach them something that they don't know that they don't know. And when you're talking about teaching little kids and screaming at them, no, just laugh. Your kid's not going to the NBA or MLS or the Prem League. Go on out there and kick the soccer ball around for an hour. Enjoy yourself. And then you'll separate. The talented ones will separate at some point. But until then, let's all have a good time and not yell at the poor referee who's making $10 an hour who's out there just trying to help the community. Like a lot, a lot of the people that are out there that are refereeing basketball or soccer or football, like they they did it because they love sports and they just want to like be a part of it and, and try to teach that love of the sport to a young and you're screaming at them. The person's making ten dollars an hour, like they're making no, they're volunteering their time. You're screaming at them. Speaking of screaming, I'm gonna scream at Julie DeCaro. I'm probably not. She's really nice. Back after this on the score. The last segment.